Hey everyone, I'm Nico from Licks of the Beast and in this video we're gonna take an in-depth look at my favorite Iron Maiden album opener, Caught Somewhere in Time. I know I've said it often, Somewhere in Time is my absolute favorite Iron Maiden album. Maybe it's because it encompasses the sci-fi futuristic spirit of the 1980s. Maybe it's because the sound and songwriting were so unique. Probably a little bit of both, but listening to it just transports me to an entirely different universe. I've built a very deep and intimate relationship with this record over the years, and I truly believe it couldn't have a more perfect opener than Caught Somewhere in Time. In this video, I'm going to break down the song part by part. We'll talk about what the guitars are doing, we'll look at some of the bass lines, I'll explain some of the music theory, and I'll try to give a little insight into the composition and arranging. So if you're ready, let's get to it. The song opens with crashing chords played by both the bass and the synth to support the main melodic theme. Now, the synths might sound normal and even obvious to many fans today, but back in 1986 this was a huge deal to a lot of people. Up until that point Maiden had a rather raw and pure heavy metal sound, and their album openers were all guitar heavy, riff based tracks. So when people dropped that needle or pressed play on their ghetto blasters for the first time, it was a shock to hear such big lush sounding synths. Now, some people loved it, some people hated it. Personally, I think it sounds absolutely fantastic. It's a cinematic sound like watching an 80s sci-fi movie. The melodic theme is played on guitar by Dave and Adrian for the intro and will then be reiterated by Bruce Dickinson in the song's chorus. The melody is an E aeolian and is harmonized in parallel fourths the first time and then the melody moves up a fourth and is harmonized in parallel fifths. In other words, one guitar plays this while the other guitar plays this. Then the first guitar moves here to play what the second guitar was doing. and the second guitar plays this on top. This is very different from Iron Maiden's normal harmonies, which are typically in thirds or sixths. Fourths and fifths are considered, like octaves, to be perfect intervals. That is, they are neither major nor minor. And this makes them sound more grounded, more stable, and not at all dreamy or musing. It's a bit of a colder sound, which perfectly recalls the laser and cyborg filled futuristic landscape depicted on the album's cover. Meanwhile, the drums are playing a mid tempo groove and the bass is playing a steady gallop rhythm, implying the chords E, C, D, A, and B. The next part is where the song actually picks up to full speed. So we started at about 105 beats per minute, then accelerated to about 115 with that mid-tempo gallop, and now the tempo changes to a really fast gallop at about 175 beats per minute. The bass and rhythm guitars are playing this. <laughs> The lead guitars are now playing a new melody, also in E aeolian, and made up mostly of short notes and rests, somewhat emulating the sound of a time machine's futuristic computer blips. So Adrian Smith's part goes like this.
and Dave Murray plays it up here. Except for the first two notes that are harmonized in fourths, this harmony is entirely in thirds, giving it more of that dreamy, slightly melancholic sound. I also want to point out that although they are playing the same melody in the same register, Dave and Adrian each use slightly different fingerings. And this is something they tend to do quite often, and it's an important but often overlooked element of the classic maiden guitar harmony. During the first half of the verse, the guitars and bass all play a basic gallop rhythm with no embellishments, leaving room for the vocal melody to stand out. The second half is similar to what they do in songs like Aces High, where the accompaniment follows the vocal melody. The guitars are playing chords like this. The bass plays something similar, but follows the vocal melody a lot closer, with a busier pattern while keeping the gallop rhythm going underneath. They go back and forth like this twice, and then they play a third verse with a slight twist. They start on E, then instead of going to the C chord, they double down on the E chord and then just let the D chord ring out before going back to the gallop on E. This is a cool way to build tension in a verse, especially when there is a narration or storytelling element to the song. In fact, they did a very similar thing on Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner on the day after day verse. In this case, the ringing D chord is like suspension points in a sentence, and it goes really well with the vocal line where he says, honestly, just let yourself go. From there, they go into an instrumental pre-chorus, and this is something I really love about the Somewhere in Time album in general. No two songs on this record have the same arrangement. Even though there's a common sound and a common feel throughout the album, each song is absolutely unique. Dave and Adrian start off by playing the exact same thing, first over a C, and then over an A. Then, Adrian breaks off into a harmony a third higher. There are two interesting things here. The first is that once again, they are playing a similar melody, but with different articulation. As in the previous example, it makes a difference in the overall sound of the part. The second thing is that whereas Dave keeps changing the accented notes to match the chords implied by the bass, Adrian will always land on E. And this makes a big difference because it feels like it's picking up speed, accelerating through time. That takes us to the chorus, which for all its simplicity is absolutely huge. Lyrically, it doesn't say much. It's just the song title repeated three times and then a long O at the end. But it communicates a whole lot emotionally. And this is because the melody is stretched out and changes directions. First it goes up, then it goes down, and then it goes up again. And another reason is that there's a good amount of space between the lines. This means the melody has a chance to breathe and the listener has a moment to take in the emotions that are being conveyed. Musically, there are two main parts going on. One played by Dave and Steve on guitar and bass respectively, and another that adds various little embellishments played by Adrian Smith. The basic part that Dave plays goes like this.
and Adrian plays something like this. After repeating the chorus, there is a short interlude. Now, the purpose of a part like this is to kind of rein the song in a little bit before letting go again. The snare rolls and tom fills over the jagged riff played by the bass and guitars really makes it feel like the song is spooling up for a moment before launching into the guitar solos. It goes like this. <laughs> Okay, so for Dave and Adrian's guitar solos, I'm not going to go too much in depth because I don't want this to be a solo tutorial and I don't want the video to be too long. I do want to say that both solos are up there with their absolute best work. Both are highly memorable and are filled with unique sounding licks and phrases. Dave takes the first solo and the rhythm behind this one is really cool, especially because there are actually two guitar parts involved. The first one is the one you probably recognize with the guitar following the bass line like this. Layered on top of that is a second part that gives it a bit more texture and atmosphere. It's not very loud in the mix, but you can definitely feel it. It goes like this. Dave's solo is so incredibly slick and slinky with his uniquely fluid style. It's in the key of D minor and he uses both the Aeolian mode and the Dorian mode interchangeably throughout the solo. The difference between the two scales is that the Aeolian mode has a minor sixth while the Dorian mode has a major sixth, giving it a slightly bittersweet quality. The first part is immediately recognizable and is made up of a first phrase based on the Dorian mode and the second phrase based on the Aeolian mode. <laughs> This is something Dave likes to do quite a bit, where he plays a melodic motif and moves it down the scale, changing it slightly as he goes along. One more thing that's worth looking at in Dave's solo is this slightly choppy lick he plays in the middle of it to break up the other more flowing licks, giving it a nice balance overall. Adrian's solo sees a key change back to E minor and is played over a simpler, more straightforward rhythm made up of whole note chords, so when they trade off, the section really opens up. So this is what he's playing over. So he plays that part twice and then... The solo itself is an absolute masterpiece, but for me, the coolest lick is this one where he mirrors Dave's choppy lick down to the choice of notes, as his is also based on a mix of the Aeolian and Dorian modes. It goes like this. <laughs> This gives the entire section a sense of continuity and really highlights just how well Dave and Adrian work together and why they've always stood out among other lead guitar duos. At the end of the solo, it tightens up again with a really cool change to B Locrian, which is a really dark mode with its minor second, minor third, flat fifth, minor sixth, and minor seventh. <laughs> Thank you. 
This part feels like a massive dark cloud coming from out of nowhere, totally changing the vibe from hopeful to dark and foreboding. It's a fantastic change and a brilliant example of how great a composer Steve Harris really is. It goes like this. <laughs> From there, the song essentially resets from the short note harmony to the verse, pre-chorus, and chorus. And to end the song, they go back to the B Locrian riff that they use to end the solo section, which is an exceptionally cool arrangement. Now, on one hand, I ask myself, how did they think of that? But then it fits so perfectly that I think it must have come naturally to just go back to that part. And that's it for this video. I really hope you enjoyed this breakdown and as always, leave your thoughts and questions in the comments. It's always great to see fun and insightful discussions down there. Thank you all so much for watching and stay tuned for more licks of the beast.